Mark's gospel. And to chapter 14. And we've been working through this chapter. And last Sunday in the morning and the evening, we considered Gethsemane. We sang the hymn, Lest I Forget Gethsemane. Now, as Jesus rises from his feet and actually says to his disciples, Let us go, here comes my betrayer, we take up our reading. In verse 43 of Mark chapter 14. This is the word of God that we are considering this morning. We read, just as he, that's Jesus, just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then the men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you've come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you, teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked leaving his garment behind. And so reads God's holy and infallible word. Before we return to consider what we've been reading, let us, let us pray together. Why don't we pray this morning? Let's pray together. Dear Lord, our God, we do thank you, Lord. We considered in some earlier that your steadfast love never ceases. And Lord, we have before us, Lord, in this chapter and the chapter that follows, Lord, the greatest evidence of your love for your people, Lord, in and through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our Lord, who is our Redeemer, who is our Savior. And Lord, in that word, in those words, redeem, Redeemer and Savior, Lord, is a display of your infinite love. Because, Lord, it isn't just that, uh, Lord, you love us and you you save us in some way that's easy for you to do. And, uh, and we're trying to say that proves your infallible love, as it were, or your unceasing love, your, un your steadfast love. But that, Lord, what it cost the Son of Man, what it cost the Son of God, what it cost you, Lord Jesus, not only to come into this world, not only to leave, Lord, the sapphire paved courts of heaven, not only to be a dependent human being, dependent on your mother, laid in a feeding trough for animals, and having to uh, um, learn your way through life, as it were, and earn your living, earn your keep, and all these things, and having to uh, suffer uh, all the uh, intolerance of sinful man. Lord, that were enough in and of itself, but Lord, to redeem us. Lord, you had to not just uh, suffer in those and suffer in the way that uh, we would suffer in terms of cold and heat and hunger and thirst and those kind of things. But then, Lord Jesus, you must suffer in the ultimate by being a sacrifice for sin. The sin of everyone who ever believed in you. Oh, Lord, we thank you that you were willing to be our redeemer. And we can sing that song, that chorus, there is a redeemer, Jesus, God's own son, precious lamb of God, Messiah, holy, we thank you, O oh Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit to go one step further, Lord, until the work on earth is done. But Lord, we step back from that because we, we see, and Lord, if we come to chapter 16, that death could not hold you, even though you gave up your life on the cross, even though you were buried in the grave, up from the grave you arose with a mighty triumph over all, over the, uh, over the devil, over sin and over death. 
that Lord you uh, Lord you raise us to newness of life and raise us now to newness of life Lord we believe on you but Lord we would experience the ultimate resurrection body and ultimate newness of life Lord as we sung uh, Lord when you were when you return at last Lord then we will sing oh Lord with unceasing joy unceasing worship unceasing devotion and in our hearts uh, filled uh, with unceasing love for you thank you for lord the glorious future that is the same so in this world we know we have trials in this world we know we have troubles lord help us to see lord uh, and to be reminded lord uh, in and through your own suffering lord jesus even as we see it here even as you are captured as it were even as they seize you Although it wasn't a capturing, Lord, because you could quite easily have resisted them. But you allowed them to see you. But even in that, Lord, even as we see your suffering, even as we considered last week, your suffering in the garden. Oh, Lord, help us all to know that at whatever point we suffer, you have suffered. And you did it for us. And so not only, Lord, have you done it for us to deliver us ultimately from all suffering, but in this world where we will have trouble. Lord, we can take heart because you've overcome the world, but we can also know that, Lord, you're able to sympathise with us in our own struggles, in our own difficulties, in our own fears, in our own dangers, in our own trials, in our own perils, in all the things that we face in life, Lord, in the uncertainties, the unknowns, oh, Lord, the things that perplex us, the things that trouble us, the things that worry us. Lord, that issue that we're faced with right now, we don't know how to deal with it. Lord, we thank you that you are able to not only sympathise with us, but Lord, through prayer, to give us the strength, to give us the wisdom, and to give us the courage, to give us the boldness, to give us, Lord, the wherewithal to go through the uh, hour of trial, the hour of difficulty, the evil hour, even the evil day, to go through all things. And thank you, Lord, that you're not a God who is in heaven, who says, well, you must go through this, even though you as God had never experienced such things. Lord, you took on our flesh. It's tremendous. You took on our flesh and you experienced all and above and beyond what we might experience. And you endured, you overcame. And so that in you, we too are overcomers. Oh, Lord, we thank you for this. And Lord, if our feet are on the rock of Christ, may we know, Lord, the edification to our hearts this morning, to what we consider as we come to your word. May it be powerful, Lord, to, uh, to fix our feet upon you once more, upon, upon your truth once more. Lord, to fix our minds, to fix our eyes upon you. Lord, if we've wavered, if we've wandered, if we've uh, travelled into pathways that we shouldn't, then, Lord, through this morning's message, Lord, even as he, we pray now, Lord, bring us back. Help us. Oh, Lord, and if we, uh, Lord, can say, well, we're not walking aright, but we, we're not so far away as, as to be in a backslidden state, but, oh, oh, it's not our cry, Lord, that you would make us more zealous. Help us then today in these things, Lord, and guide and lead us all, Lord. There are those, Lord, who have decisions to make as well, and there are those who struggle with illness, ongoing illness, awaiting results. Uh, and, Lord, in the natural, in the human, Lord, and it's right, Lord, this is, we're frail, Lord, to, to fear these things. Oh, Lord, we pray that you would raise us up. We pray that you would strengthen us. We pray that you would, uh, Lord, uh, give us answers that we need to have where we need to have them. And again, that wisdom, Lord, to know what we should do. Lord, we pray that you would help us to prevail and that, Lord, you would bring us right through. Bring us, if we are poorly in any way, Lord, to fullness of health again, we ask. And, Lord, help us all to be those who are ready, even tonight, to die. If you die tonight, would you go to heaven? Lord, may we able, be able to say a hearty amen. A hearty amen from hearts that are assured the salvation that is ours in Christ Jesus. Hear us in this, Lord. Come to our land. Bless our land, Lord, in these days. Revive your church, Lord, in the land that we live in, Lord. Bless our missionaries, Lord. Bless especially the Saywells. Be with them. Strengthen them, Lord God. Do uphold the church in, in China, Lord. Give them strength. In other places where there is persecution, Lord. May, uh, Lord, they know your hand upon them. May they know your strength. They're helping, Lord. So hear us, Lord, in all of these things and other things beside, Lord, come to us.
Help us at our point of need and help the preacher now, Lord. You know the wrestle he's had. You know the trouble he's had. You know, Lord, he had that dream one time where it was that way for preaching a sermon, the other way for running away, and how in the other room he wanted to run the other way. Oh, Lord, please come and equip him. For, Lord, no man can really truly do what you call them to. Unless Lord, you equip them for the task. So we come before you this morning and pray for your power to be upon the remainder of our service. And when we come to the table, when we come to the bread and bread, Lord, may it be a real blessing to our hearts. And may everything serve to glorify you. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the start of chapter 14, we saw how they, uh, the religious leaders, let's call them that, wanted to seize the Lord Jesus Christ. And Judas was the one who agreed to do that. And here in the passage we've just read, if we were um, scholars or those who could read New Testament Greek, we would see that three times in this short passage, in these short verses, uh, they are seeking to seize, or the, the Mark uses the word seize, then coming to seize the Lord Jesus Christ. And here we see the one who's leading the season is one for whom it would be no shock to those gathered around to see him kiss the Lord Jesus Christ, because he, he's one of the twelve. He's a friend even of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's remarkable, isn't it? He betrays the Lord Jesus Christ with a kiss. But they're coming to seize, and they send. What do they send? Uh, they, they send an army, we read in verse 43. There's a crowd armed with clubs and swords. Like an army that's... An armed mob, we might say. Why? What are they expecting? Some years ago, I, I went to a, a wedding where the father of the bride was expecting a punch-up with the groom's family. There wasn't a punch-up, and the groom's family didn't come looking for a punch-up. They were only looking for a celebration. What are they expecting here? They're expecting not just a punch-up, expecting a war. Even soldiers amongst those who are sent. What are they expecting from the Lord Jesus Christ? It shows here, doesn't it, in the, uh, that Judas has gone along with this, that Judas doesn't really know the Lord at all, does he? Doesn't really know him at all. And certainly the religious leaders don't. If they could, surely they'd have sent a bigger army, a bigger mob. The reason they don't is because they don't want anyone to know. They don't want a, a kerfuffle. They don't want a crowd to come and defend Jesus. But a big army. Or a mob, an armed mob, for one man, and just a few fishermen. But isn't that the way it is with the, the kingdoms of the world, whether that's religious kingdoms or secular kingdoms of the world, force and violence? We can say that the, the blood of the victims is so often the river uh, that sweeps men into power. And in this verse as well, it says here in verse 43, just as he was speaking, but the word is immediately, Judas, one of the 12, Mark returns back to, remember that? We looked at that when we first started this, that that word immediately is something like, I think I've looked to memory, 11 times in the first chapter, the pace of Mark's gospel. But it's slowed here for these events in this chapter. But now he picks up the pace again. He immediately, immediately, the speed with which uh, they come, as it were, this armed mob. And the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, well, they're not prepared. They're not prepared. And they panic, don't they? Would we be prepared? Would we panic in that situation? You wouldn't go to an exam without revising, would you? Be foolish to go to an exam without revising. Yet they go here. 
to this time, this power that the Lord Jesus Christ has been telling them about, they go to this hour without preparation. Part of what we're looking at this morning is, what is the preparation? What is the preparation? But then we can see as well, there is one, despite the disciples, there is one who's truly prepared, not just for the armed mob, but where that armed mob is going to take him and what it's going to lead to, even ultimately, the death on the cross. The Lord Jesus Christ, oh, he's truly prepared to face all of that. Let's look briefly at the traitor because we, we've considered Judas really before. But we read in verse 44 there that he's, he's arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man, which tells us, of course, it, it's nighttime, it's dark, and only someone who would know him well would be able to recognize him in that darkness. So he says, I will betray him with a kiss and going up to him. At once he says, Rabbi, and he kisses him. As one writer says, with a sign of devotion, he betrays the Lord. And yet, as we've seen before, Judas was warned. He was warned by the Lord about these things. Not to go back into that, but just to add this to all that we considered before. The one thing he couldn't do, Judas, was testify against the Lord Jesus Christ. He was willing to betray him. Wouldn't you testify him, uh, testify against him? No, I'll betray him, but I won't testify against him. Why won't you testify against him? Because he never did anything wrong. He never did anything wrong. Judas can't testify against him, can he? And yet there was a time, Judas, who betrays him with a kiss, there was a time when he would have been shocked to hear from the lips of Jesus that one of you will betray me. He was one of the 12 who went out in twos. He was one of the 72 who went out in twos, delighted to tell people of the kingdom of God coming and that it's through Christ, or that Jesus is indeed the Christ. How he did that with delight, how happy he was to have the responsibility for holding the money bag, the money purse. If the Bible says faith comes through hearing, hearing the word of God, Judas heard it from the greatest lips of all, from the master himself. He would have been seen, would he not, as one who belonged, one who was part of the church. How did it get to this? How did it get to him doing this? You have to say, we, we're not given a real window, are we, into his heart, but taking what we can from scripture, we would say it probably started with something small, a small sin. We're told in John that he had that money back, that he was a thief and he used to take from it. We can surmise he didn't always take from it. There was a time when he felt quite privileged to have that responsibility. But then, untied, he was lured into temptation. And once you've done it once, it's easy to go back again. And once you've done it again, it's easy to go back a third time. And it's easy to take more and more. And when sin gets a hold, it gets a real grip on a person's heart. We considered uh, before how Jesus told his disciples to watch, watch, he was saying, watch and pray. But we might take the prayer away just for a moment and say, watch, watch out. And a word to watch. Watch out, watch out. Little leads to greater. When I first stole from my uncle, how could you do such a thing? It's only a small amount of money. How could you do such a thing against a member of your own family? But you did it. What did that lead to? Ultimately, what did it lead to? It led to more than one night in a police cell, not for this 
matter, nothing to do with this matter, but other things, you see, sin grows, it develops, it blossoms, well, it doesn't blossom, does it? It's not a good thing in that sense, but it brings up the, the weeds and the filth and the guns in other areas of your life. So one small sin for a family member led to nights in a police cell and four appearances before law courts. See, it starts off little, but it leads to greater, doesn't it? For Judas, there's clearly no change in his heart. No change. It said in verse 21, the Lord said to him, woe to that man who betrays the son of man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. He was someone who heard from the lips of Jesus. He was someone who had all the privileges of being one of the inner circle, one of the twelve. And how is it not that, or is it not also that there are those who come into a church building who even maybe belong to a church, they hear the word of God, they experience and enjoy the privileges of being called a, a member of a church. Actually, it's no change of heart. No change of heart. What is needed and what Judas lacked was a heart change. Have you had a heart change? Has the heart of stone been removed? Is there now a heart of flesh that is beating even for the living Lord Jesus Christ? There's the traitor. But then secondly, moving to the latter part, and we'll come back to the Lord Jesus Christ's words. But secondly, the mass panic that you see in verse 50, how it says... Everyone deserted Jesus and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Fear overcame faith, didn't it? And as one writer says here, we have the first recorded streak in history, which is quite remarkable, really, isn't it? The Bible's got everything, you know. <laughs> the first recorded streak in history. But it's not a sponsored one, is it? <laughs> do, do you do sponsored ones? I don't know. Let's not get into that. But you see, his literal what he does, fleeing naked, he, he represents what's there in verse 50. Everyone deserting and fleeing. He represents them in their worst light. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. The fear of man. Fear of man in them. Fear of man in him. Some people compare what this young man did with, with Joseph in the Old Testament, but you can't make that comparison. Joseph fled from Potiphar's wife because he feared sin. These are fleeing. Because they fear man. Joseph ran through the fear of God and through devotion to God. Leads through devotion to self, love for self, self preservation. All drank the cup, all vowed to die, but all panicked, all forsook. The Lord Jesus Christ. They would rather leave naked even and keep their life in this world. And indeed, in this very passage, it's right to say there is a fulfillment of a prophecy in Amos. In chapter 2, right at the end of the chapter, even the bravest warrior will flee naked on that day. Even the bravest warrior fleeing naked on that day. Why do they do this? Overconfidence in the Lord or themselves? This overconfidence in the Lord, but what do I mean? I mean misplaced confidence, misunderstanding his intentions, imagining that somehow the Lord Jesus Christ is going to triumph and over, triumph, be triumphant over them militarily, is he? Raise up his own army, pull down angels to fight or something like that. So their confidence in the Lord is a, a misplaced confidence, if it is indeed. 
but it's overconfidence in the Lord, misunderstanding his intentions. Uh, there are people out there who, uh, who sometimes no fault of their own, who faulty teaching, come to Christ, and everything will be wonderful. Victory, victory, victory. Which, of course, it is victory. But it's victory over sin. It's victory ultimately over death. And it's having the Lord in your life to strengthen you when you go through trials. But the impression given is you come to Christ, you'll never have any trials. Got money worries? Put a bit more in the bag and you'll never have any money worries yourself, you see, because the Lord promises uh, the cheerful giver will be blessed abundantly. Oh, we'll have a harvest themselves. Many people make themselves rich with lying and cheating on people in such a way. And so many people are misled, misunderstood, misguided, rather, through a poor teaching, through a teaching that is false. And then things go wrong and they say, well, why this? Why is that happening? Why is this happening to me? Misplaced confidence, misplaced understanding. Misunderstanding of scripture. What's the golden rule? It's an opportunity to bring it again, isn't it? It's always good to remind ourselves of the golden rule. And the golden rule is, well, I've got two. I always have two when I say the golden rule. One is you look and you read in the context. You read the passage. You read it in its original context. You don't take it out of context or anything like that. And the other and the main golden rule is this that you compare scripture with scripture. When something is unclear in one place, look for greater light from another place that will help you understand correctly what the passage is saying. Golden rule of scripture. Context and compare scripture with scripture. And then we can say as well, if they are overconfident in themselves, which of course, of course, that is what is going on here, overconfident in themselves. Well, there's a lesson for us all here, isn't there? In their uh, fleeing, in their panic, the lesson for us all is well, we shouldn't be confident in ourselves. That's what got us into the mess in the first place. That's what gets us into every mess. Overconfidence in ourselves. Our confidence is in the Lord. And so the Christian's best clothing is humility. Humility. Not nakedness. He clothes us in righteousness. In his robes of righteousness. But then the best clothing <coughs> to go with that. Best way to dress, as it were, is with humility, isn't it? Humility. Lord, I need you. Every hour we see. Every hour I need you. And the wonderful thing is that we don't see it necessarily directly in this passage, but the Lord has already promised this. We know our Bible, so we know this is going to be true, that he doesn't reject his disciples. That though they all panic and flee, he doesn't reject them, he doesn't shout out after them, we don't bother coming back. He doesn't do anything like that. Because the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They knew every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Every day, even though we fail, he remains faithful still. And so it's good news for us then, isn't it? In our own failings, these disciples, they fell, but the Lord raised them up again. They rose in repentance. They rose in repentance to lead the church into the New Testament age. But more importantly, and more well, equally important, but for us especially, is that they rose to, yes, repentance, but then holiness of life. And so whether it's that we have never come to them, and we repent of our sin, and we turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, and then he raises us, doesn't he, to that new life to be able to live in a way that is pleasing in his sight. And if we've already been born again, and yet we stumble like they've done here, and we backslide. When we repent, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So he lifts us up again. 
He cleanses us again. We're not born again again. But he does cleanse us again. He gives us new strength, doesn't he? To carry on. Wiser. It's not to say that it's good to fall so that we become wiser. It's better not to fall. It's the wisest way is to look at these falling and say, well, I ain't going to do that. Lord, give me strength. When we come back to him, he gives us our strength so that we can go on and serve him in holiness and in truth. But what I want to come to is uh, the, the main part of this is what I would call peace like a river. Peace like a river. We go back to verse 46, having been kissed by Judas. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. And then we read, then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Now, this is a tense moment. This is a dangerous time. There is a, a story in history, 1890, South Dakota, and it's known as the last battle between the cavalry and the North Americans, North American Indians. I don't know if you can call them that anymore today. I, I don't know, but whatever. The, uh, those who were the original citizens of that place. <laughs> Let me put it that way. And I've got it wrong, I know. But, but there they are. And they've got them surrounded. The cavalry, and it's the seventh cavalry. You know your history. You'll know the Battle of Little Big War. Custer and the seventh Cav cavalry were decimated. Here's an opportunity for revenge. And these Native Americans, these Native Americans are gathered around, several hundred. And there's tension. And the cavalry decide that they need to disarm them. And so they put out a call that all the um, people are to give up their guns, all the natives are to give up their guns. One man refuses to. He's deaf. And in the struggle with a soldier, his gun goes off. Immediately, the cavalry start to open fire with howitzers and with all manner of guns. And something like 300 of the Native Americans are massacred. See the tension. And one thing going wrong leads to absolute disaster. Is that what's going to happen here? Is there about to be a massacre? They've come up, they're armed with swords and clubs. They're shouting. Some are shouting from fear. Some are shouting because they're reaching for a fight. And, and anything can happen here. And then what happens? We know it's Peter from John's Gospel. But Peter brandishes a sword. And he cuts off Malchus, one of the servants of the high priest, cuts off his ear. Is this it? Is there now going to be a massacre? But in the midst of all of that, one voice rings out clear. And it's the voice of the commander in chief of the whole of humankind. Am I leading a rebellion? And I don't know the tone of voice that it's said, but it's said with an authority. It's said with a power. It's said as a command that causes skill from those who would wield their clubs or thrust with their swords. He's already shown them, we pick it up in John's Gospel, he's already shown them the futility of their carnal weapons and the carnal warfare of man. I am. You know what happens there? Huh? They hear it. They fall back. The power of the voice of Jesus naming the name. They fall back to the ground. It's there in John's account. Now when he speaks, there is calm amongst the armed mob. Because there is one who is calm. <laughs> Is Jesus a revolutionary? Something to debate. Jesus, a revolutionary? Yes or no? He's not a revolutionary in that he came into this world to restore the kingdom of God. That's what he came to do. 
And he doesn't do that with threats. It's done through an inner work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, a revolution. Oh, there's revolution in the heart, isn't there? There's revolution in the heart, the heart in whom the Holy Spirit begins to work. There's revolution. Have you experienced revolution in your heart? It's to be revolution. To overturn the government that's there. The government that's there is self. Me, me, me. Only when the Holy Spirit begins to work, that there'll be change. A change of government. Revolution. And Christ. The Lamb. Will be all the glory. In the heart. And those uh, members of the armed mob, in the stilling of their uh, minds and their hearts of the voice of Jesus, so that they don't get their revenge, they don't seek to fight back, they don't do anything. Because of what Jesus says. Because of something of who Jesus is. I wonder, I wonder how many of them might have been. Here a mob wielding sword and club. On the day of Pentecost, on their knees, crying out to Peter, what must we do? What must we do? What must we do to be saved? And then Jesus, having said, am I leading with rebellion? Says that you come out with swords and clubs to catch me. Every day I was with you, te teaching in the temple courts. And you did not arrest me. Now we, we have here, am I leading a rebellion? But that's not what's in the Greek. In the Greek is, am I a thief or a robber? A thief and a robber who's sneaky. What thieves are, aren't they? You know, they know someone who, uh, unless they're really, you know, blatant and, and not, well, stupid, they, they do things sneakily. They come up behind you and, and sneak your purse, don't they? They come up behind you and, and they do, they break into the house at night. Sneaky people. Thieves and robbers, nighttime, so it's unseen, so they're unseen. Jesus says, if that's me, how can that be me? You've seen me. I've been openly, daily, speaking. Am I preaching? Was it the words of a crook? Was I saying things that would be crookery? And yet, note the irony. You come in secret. You come at night. You come to steal, to steal one's freedom. You see, it's not Jesus who's leading a rebellion. It's the heart of man, the heart of man leading a rebellion. That's what your heart, my heart does when we hear the truth. Until we're converted, we rebel even more. We were rebels anyway. We're born rebels. But we rebel even more. We say, I don't want that. I don't want that. We fight against even as they're doing. But you see, coming back to Christ, there's, there's no drama in Christ. He's in control. I don't think, and I'm not going to shout, but I don't think, imagine me shouting now, how am I reading my rebellion? Like they put uh, Cromwell in um, the, 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 the film that they made of him, what's it called? I can't remember what it's called now. Uh, the Cromwell film. <laughs> yeah. oh, well, there we are. I can't think of the actor, but he really shouts and so forth all the time. Right? You know, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> yeah, but no, I don't. I don't. There's no drama here. He's in control. The, there's mass panic, or well, there there will be, and there is even now. But there will be mass panic in his disciples, but not in Christ. Not in Christ. He's the only one who's truly prepared. For the hour that's come upon him, the Lord is ready for that. And I want to ask, what, what's the reason? Or what are the reasons? What's the reason for his calm? How is it he can be calm? How is it he can be steadfast? You know, what usually happens is if there's a few of you there and there's a threat and one person runs, what usually happens is it spreads to everyone. Like, well, I've probably done that here, hasn't it? Even a man, you know, prepared to go naked, streak and run away. It normally happens. But one man doesn't. One man doesn't. You say, oh, it's because they seized him. He had the opportunity. He could flee as well. 
Or he could say, fight, one's already been willing to do that, cutting off a, a, an ear of someone, so forth. He's calm. Why is he calm? He's calm because he's certain of his mission. He knows what he has come to do. He knows his hour has come. In verses 22 to 24, which we've looked at before, and we will consider this morning, he took the cup, gave thanks, offered it to them. They all drank from it. Then he said, and indeed you can go back to verse 22 to get the full picture, while they're eating, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, take it. This is my body. Read about the cup. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. I tell you the truth, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it anew. Now, don't think for one moment I'm trying to go down a Roman Catholic line and say somehow the red wine changes into the body and blood of Christ. That's nonsense. He's not saying, this is literally my body. But what he's saying, what I want us to pick up here, and the reason I'm emphasizing the is, and uh, the um, um, I will not, the reason I'm emphasizing that is to show the certainty of Christ. The absolute certainty that he knows what his mission is. This is, this will, I will. He's certain of his mission. And not only that, he's certain of his mission, but he's also confident in the word of God. Confident in the word of God, we might say to uphold him. Confident in the word of God as being true. God's truth, his truth. And so you read in verse 49, he says, right at the end, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. He has confidence in the word of God. This is going to lead to the fulfilling of scripture. This is what scripture has prophesied. This is why I can be certain of my mission, because it's now being carried out in accordance with the word of God. This is certain. The word of God is certain. I'm certain of my mission. I'm confident because of the word of God. In verse 21, having uh, he said about, he says in verse 21, he says, the son of man will go how would he go? Just as it is written about him. And of course, just as it is written about him is in the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures. Just as it's written there. So his trust or rather his confidence in the word of God. I don't know. Vital to meditate on scripture, isn't it? Vital to meditate. But we like to encourage one another by giving one another scriptures. It's good for us to encourage ourselves with scripture promises. But remember, they're all about him. All the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus. What about Jesus? Again, read the Psalms. What about Christ? Read them in their original context. See the original author's predicament or joy or whatever it might be, sorrow, sadness. But then ultimately, look to Christ. Because it belongs to him. The scriptural promises that we encourage ourselves in. They're about him for us. But here now, he, he stands in the flesh. And the promises are, are not just about him. They're for him. They're for him. To uphold him. So he can be confident in all that he's about to experience, in all that he's about to face. They're promising him. What are they promising him? Huh. They're promising him suffering and pain. They're promising him separation and loss. They're promising him wrath. The wrath of his father. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity, the sin of us all. He's laid it on him. He's going to punish him 
in our place. Scripture promises him the wrath of the Father. Your wrath taken by Christ if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He understood from Scripture. Listen to this. In fact, you can go back and follow it with me. What, chapter 10 and verse 33. This is what he understood. This is what Scripture taught him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. That's what the scriptures promised. And he was confident that the scriptures will be fulfilled. But they promised too. They promised him victory, ultimately. And so we can read in the Psalms, you will not abandon me to the grave or let your holy see decay. You see, Psalms, apply it in its original context, who was the original author? What did it mean for them to take it to Christ? You will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. That promise was there for Jesus. Now he's standing here in the flesh and he can draw strength from that promise. And so he can say, three days later, he will rise. See, it will, it will, it will, it will. He says again and again, he will be. They will do this. But I will rise. How do I know I'll rise? You will not abandon me to the ground. Nor will you let your Holy One see decay. That's not just someone um, being hopeful. That's a truth that was written for Christ to apply even here, even as he faces this trial upon trials. And then uh, as well we can say, his trust in the Father. We think of the certainty of his mission, and his confidence in the word of God, but then his trust in the Father. In verse 36, he says, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Because you're at best. Because I trust in you. He trusted in his Father, that in what his Father had promised to do, his Father would carry it out, even to that victory. There's trust in his father. Trusting the father to do his work. There's no panic. He's eager to embrace all this. Why? How? How is it he's able to uh, um, have confidence in his uh, certainty of his mission? Confidence in the word of God. Trust in his father. How can he hold on to those things? Now he's facing this trial. Say, so, oh, he's the son of God. No, that's not the reason. He is the son of God, but that's not the reason he's able to stay steadfast. He was made to be like us in every way, except without sin. How can he overcome? How can he stand when panic's setting in? How does it not infiltrate him? How has he guarded his heart against these things? Even with that trust, even with that confidence, even with that certainty. How does he hold to those things? One thing having it, but now comes a trial. How do you hold to it? I hold to the certainty of the word of God. I trust in my Father in heaven. I'm confident, or certain of my mission, as it were, certain of the Lord's calling. But now comes a trial I'm facing. How am I going to withstand? How am I going to hold firm? How am I going to stand firm? How are you going to stand firm? Did Christ stand firm? How did he overcome? Did he lean on his divinity? Then he's no example for us to follow if that's what he did. He's God, therefore, he's aloof. Don't think that for one moment. His suffering was real. He suffered in every way. His trust in the Father, his confidence in the word of God, his certainty of the mission, all these things held, they were gained and held through prayer. Prayer, that's the key. That's the answer. Through prayer. Jesus knew at this time a peace like a river. How? Through prayer, through prayer, even up to and on the cross. You know, well, there's a time, is there? But just think of the, the words of Christ as he's going to the cross and as he goes to the cross. Is this a man in panic? Is this a man in fear? 
It's a man who's about to give up his life. It's a man who has an inner peace. Because he's certain of his mission. He's confident in the word of God. He trusts in the Father. He holds on to these things in the greatest hour through prayer. That is what we must do. The only one who's truly prepared here is the Lord Jesus Christ. Are we prepared? Are we prepared in life or death? Are we prepared to live? Are we prepared to die? If we die tonight, would we go to him? Are we prepared? The only way to be prepared is to know Christ. Do you know Christ? And if you know Christ, how do you prepare yourself for the evil hour? It's prayer, gazing, praying. The disciples were warned that they would fail. They should be preparing their hearts. How could they prepare their hearts? Watch and pray. They didn't. You know, if you needed to pray, well, surely what they could do is rather than sit down, boy, I'm going to fall asleep again if I do this. The Lord has already exhorted us to watch and pray. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to get up and look around. Such a good thing to do is prayer. It's a very good thing to do. Focuses the mind, helps you concentrate. You're out in the air as well, rather than in a stuffy room and maybe on your knees or whatever where you can topple over and get walking. They don't do that. They don't do that. You have the first recorded streak in history. Be dressed and ready for service. Keep your lamp burning, says the scripture. His fleeing naked symbolizes their lack of preparedness. Their lack of the birds sleep. And there isn't time, I was more I wanted to say, but let me let me just close it in, in this way. The only one who's truly prepared is the one here who's going to take the lead role, is the one facing all. And we can learn from that as well. That cometh the hour, the Lord offers the means. The Lord gives the means for each one so that we can be truly prepared. Not before, but on, at that time. He doesn't increase our faith before the event. Or we should build ourselves up before the event, for sure. But we don't suddenly feel that surge of strength that the Lord can give before the event. It's in the event, when it's needed. The evil day, the evil hour, the evil night, is Gained and held through prayer. And peace like a river is the outcome for the Christian who uses prayer to seek the Lord's grace, the Lord's enabling. Christ sought to be truly prepared for love for his Father and love for us. There's the two great commands. Love for God, love for your neighbor. What does he say to us? Love. Do likewise. Amen.